the Bible in one sentence, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but will have life everlasting. John 3.16, God's great love for us today. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place.
praise the name of the Lord today. You know what we do here every Sunday, every week for that matter, takes so many people doing their job, serving the Lord faithfully week in and week out. Let's take a look at the screens. Our church family was a lifeline for me to my faith when I was going through a really hard season. So serving helps me remember that we are all in this together, that we are not alone. I remember sitting in church and hearing about positions that needed to be filled or jobs that needed to be done. And I thought somebody should do something. And then I realized that actually, Maybe I am that somebody. And I always remember a saying from a missionary to China that said, only one life will soon be passed and only what's done for God will last. This is why I serve. One of the reasons I love our church is because they allow women to serve in leadership roles. By serving as a deacon or on a committee, you get to pay back or give back to a church that we all love. I serve because of Jesus' life example of service to others. Each of us are a unique and special creation of God that can glorify God in service to this church that gives our life purpose and meaning. I serve because as a Christian, we are told to follow the example of Jesus. And as he said in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I hope you will shine your light here in our church. Serving in the church uh, was a part of my home, but I wasn't involved other than just as a participant until the summer after my senior year in high school. A church asked me to be their summer youth director, but the pastor asked me if I would try to find a a teacher for the fifth grade boys Sunday school class. Nobody seemed to want to do it. So I went back to the pastor. The pastor said, don't worry about it. I can find somebody. You teach them. I've been teaching now for 62 years. 45 of those years are right here at First Baptist Church of Richardson. I serve First Baptist Richardson because God brought me here almost 10 years ago. This church is so welcoming, so loving. They just took us in and accepted us so very well. And I want everyone to know that. I want everyone in this place to have a home, to have a family, to be connected, to know God, to grow in God, to abide in God. Since God sent us His Son to die for our sins, even mine, that's the least that we can do is to serve in this wonderful church. Good morning, church. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for spending part of your Sunday morning with us here at First Baptist. And you know, we, we just saw the video, Why I Serve. My question to you is, for all of you who are not serving, is why don't you serve? Why don't you serve? We have lots and lots and lots of opportunities to meet whatever your gifts and talents are. And I would encourage you, come speak to Andy, speak to me, speak to any of the pastors on staff. We will work with you to find that special place where you can be productive and find joy in serving the Lord. So why don't you serve? One way you can serve is through our committees and through our deacons. And at the bottom of the scrolls up there, when, when the people came on the, the video, it showed the, the places of service. And many of them were deacons. Many of them were on committees. This is the time of year where we begin to take nominations for our deacons, for our committee members, for the church year coming up, beginning next April, the 2024-2025 uh, church year. And what you can do for us, one way you can serve, is to, to begin to make nominations for people to serve as deacons, for people to serve in the various committees. That's your service right now. I just give you that charge. Nominations are open today through October the 8th. 
and you can scan the QR code. I believe it's on the screen. Yes, you can scan the QR code. You can go to our website, fbcr.org slash nominate, or you can text nominate to our church number, 972-235-5296. Do go and, and find that, that, that information that explains what each of the committees is responsible for and the qualifications for that, the qualifications for deacon, and just prayerfully nominate folks to serve in, in those positions. Also, let me uh, inform you of the Bible studies that are going on on Thursdays. We have a precepts Bible study class. We have two women's Bible study classes that happen on Thursday mornings. And you can find out more about those if you'll just go to our website and, and click on adults and you can get more information there. Our international friends. Our international friends program has been going on for over 50 years in this church. And we've served this community in helping others to learn uh, the English language and those classes start back this Wednesday and, and if you want to to help somebody to register or you need to register or you want to volunteer again go to our website and uh, just click on missions and you can find the information there as well now one other thing you received a bulletin this morning the bottom of that bulletin is a tear off I want everybody in the room to tear that off. If you're a member, we want to have your name there. If you have a change to address, email, or phone number, please make that uh, correction and we'll get it changed in our system. If you're a guest, if you're not a member of First Baptist Church, you're our guest and we would love to have information about you. So if you would include that on the card and let us know how best to contact you, we want to reach out to you and and just uh, extend an invitation to help you get connected if that's uh, what you're looking for in a church home. And on the back of that card is prayer requests. If you have prayer requests this morning, please uh, write those down, drop those in the offering plate in just a moment as this passed. And on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday nights, our prayer team will be praying specifically for your request. So share those and, and uh, just know that we are praying with you for whatever your need might be. Okay, thank you. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures of fate are never enough.
Oh, that's a great song of what our God can do. God is moving in this place right now. I want you to hear a special word from our pastor search committee. Randy Johnson, come on and share with us. Take a seat. I bring you greetings from the pastor search committee, actually your pastor search committee. We have now met a total of eight times since our first meeting on May the 23rd. And even though we are not in a hurry, we are moving along at a brisk pace with no wasted time. Under the excellent and capable leadership of our chairperson, Kathy Porter, we meet twice a month for, for up to two hours each time, and we are making progress. We cannot thank you enough for your prayers and support. We had a great response from our church family, you, our church family, in both the listening sessions, which took place mostly on Sunday morning during Bible study time, and from the online survey. 526 people participated in the listening sessions and 266 participated in the online survey. The detailed results of both the listening sessions and the survey have been posted on the website just this morning at fbcr.org. From these two resources, though, we've discovered that regardless of the worship service one attends or their age, the responses were very similar. In fact, we can give thanks to God for the, the commonality that we have in this church family. We have much to, to be thankful for in terms of the common thoughts that we have. We learned that you want a biblical preacher, a biblical gifted preacher who excels in pastoral care and shepherding and possesses strong leadership skills. You also told us that we need to attract more young families and singles and to improve our communication and community outreach, even though we're making some progress in each of these. The committee is currently using these findings to develop a pastor profile. When it is finished, we will post it on the church website as well. The profile will be used to help us determine our best candidates for our new senior pastor. And when we find that person, we will present it to the church for a vote. For now, we ask that each member of the church continue to pray that the right candidates are, who are led by God to send us their resumes and, the, and that the committee will be able to clearly discern God's will for our future meetings and decisions. That's the report. Now, on a personal note, I'm not sure if you know it or not, but everyone who claims to be a follower of Christ has been given certain abilities by God that we call spiritual gifts. These gifts or abilities have been given to us, as the Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, to help build up the church. Every believer has one or more gifts, and when we use our gifts on behalf of the church, God produces in us evidence that we belong to Him. We call these fruit of the Spirit. When Carol and I moved to this area with our two young daughters, we moved into a house that had three fruit trees in the backyard, an apple tree, a pear tree, and an apricot tree. And the pear tree and the apricot tree produced plenty of fruit. But the apple tree, for some reason, there wasn't a single apple on that apple tree. Now, I guess we could have done a little research and found out what the problem was. But uh, it wasn't a, a, a short time until uh, the beavers who lived in our little pond nearby took all three of those trees out in 48 hours. So we didn't have a chance to figure that out. But I couldn't help think about that apple tree. That's so strange. And it was so disappointing to me. And then I thought, then I thought, how disappointed God must be when we do not produce the fruit he has designed us to produce. So what kind of fruit are we talking about? Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 
through 25. And as I read this, these few verses, I want you to ask yourself two questions. One is, what qualities do I already possess? What fruit am I giving evidence of that on this list? And then ask the second question, what are some of these fruits that God needs to develop in me and bring out in me so that I can continue to help our church? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Based on this passage, we might say this is exactly the kind of pastor we need for our church. And I would say to all of us, this is also exactly the kind of church member we need to be for our pastor and for our Lord so that we can become the kind of church God has designed us to be. May it be so for First Baptist Church of Richardson. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you at this time of our worship service, where we offer back to you that which is yours, we ask you to help us remember some things. We ask you to help us remember that the world and all that is in it is yours and we are but stewards for a short time. We ask you to help us keep a good heart and to give graciously and enthusiastically. We ask that you bless these tithes and these offerings to the furtherance of your kingdom and help the giving of these tithes and offerings draw us closer to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for the message from Ryan today, listen to these words from Romans chapter 14. Welcome all the Lord's followers, even those whose faith is weak. Don't criticize them for having beliefs that are different from yours. Some think it is all right to eat anything, while those whose faith is weak will eat only vegetables. But you should not criticize others for eating or for not eating. After all, God welcomes everyone. What right do you have to criticize someone else's servant? Only the Lord can decide if they are doing right, and the Lord will make sure that they do right. Some of the Lord's followers think one day is more important than another. Others think all days are the same. But each of you should make up your own mind. Any followers who count one day more important than another day do it to honor their Lord. And any followers who eat meat give thanks to God, just like the ones who don't eat meat. Whether we live or die, it must be for God rather than for ourselves. Whether we live or die, it must be for the Lord. Alive or dead, we still belong to the Lord. This is because Christ died and rose to life so that he would be the Lord of the dead and of the living. Why do you criticize other followers of the Lord? Why do you look down on them? The day is coming when God will judge all of us. In the scriptures, God says, I swear by my very life that everyone will kneel down and praise my name. And so each of us must give an account to God for what we do. Our God has shown us his mercy. He's shown us grace. And he asks that us, as his followers, do the same. We thank him for that example of mercy and grace. Let's stand and sing. Praise the Lord.
God's people said, amen. Take a seat. Good morning, everyone. If you don't know me, my name's Ryan Musser, and I am very mild-mannered and a quiet preacher, so don't worry about anything. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. As he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all possessions, payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then this Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. To put this passage in context, we have to look at what just came before. Jesus started a conversation up in verse 15. He started a conversation about forgiving our brothers and sisters, about when we have problems with our brothers and sisters. Now, he uses a word there that he doesn't often use. He says, our brothers and sisters, and he says, and you'll take them before the ecclesia, That's the word we translate church. Jesus a lot of times talks about the kingdom, but he's talking about in this passage about the fact that in the assembly of God's people, which at the time would have been Israel and then later the church, in that word, that word's translated assembly or later on church, in in these people there are going to be problems where people sin against you. And it wouldn't have necessarily been in their local synagogue. It might have just been someone across the street. In your brother or sister or neighbor sins against you, you go and you talk to them about it and you try to work things out. And Jesus gives an idea of how to do that. And that's a good sermon and we could do that one today, but it's not the one we're doing today. And Peter, being Peter, asks the great question. Okay, Jesus, let's assume for a second that I do exactly what you say. I go and I start this thing out, and let's assume that I'm right and they're wrong, and that they really have sinned against me, and that they know it, and they ask for forgiveness. In that scenario, in that particular set of events, how many times do I have to forgive them? Peter says up to seven times. Seven would have been a pretty generous number. There were a lot of people who said four was it. You could cut it off at that point in time. Seven seems pretty good. I don't know if you've been wronged a lot, but seven sometimes seems a little bit pushy if it's something that continues to happen over and over again. Seven times, that's quite a bit. Well done, Peter. And Jesus gives a ridiculous number. He says not seven times, but 70 times seven, or 77 times. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, this place where God rules on earth as he does in heaven, that place looks something like this. A king wanted to settle up his accounts. 
So he called in all of those who had loans and debts in his name. The maturity date had come, as a lawyer from real estate would say. And so all of those who owe him things come in. It's a lot of slaves, servants. In Greek, it's daulos, the same word, slave, servant. And that is a different system of slavery than we think of in the United States. It is not that system. The system of slavery in the United States was a whole different level of atrocity. I'm not saying I like this system. I'm just saying this isn't that. This system is a credit card system. You need some money and you don't have it, so what can you do? Visa and MasterCard just hadn't quite gotten there yet. So if you need a loan and you can't go down to your local Texas state bank, what are you to do? You can go and offer for yourself, if you don't have a lot of other property that is collateral and value, you can say, look, if you loan me 100 denarii, I will work for you, and until I pay it off, I will continue to do work, and I'll work at this wage, and I'll do this, and I'll pay this loan off, and there's a date that it'll be due, and we'll do that, and that's the idea. And so that's exactly what had gone on, and the king is calling in all of those debts. It's due day, it's tax day, it's April 15th, and everybody knows it's time has come. And so I imagine that there is a line stretching out this door, there's a lobby there, and you have slave after slave who's coming and coming to settle up their accounts. And standing in this line of servants is one servant who owes 10,000 talents. Now a talent has been described monetarily in many different ways, but the idea was that a talent was about a year's wage. This guy has a debt problem. It's an immeasurable debt. Some have estimated it at a billion dollars, and I don't think that probably does it justice. In real estate, we would say that this particular lender, this king, is under secure. If somebody gives you a loan for your home for half a million dollars, and the market starts to crash, and it's only worth $300,000 in a year or two, and they go to foreclose and take the home, they're going to get $300,000 for it not 500, which means they're losing $200,000. That's called being under secure. You don't have the full value in the thing that you thought was protecting this loan. Here, the king has given all of these talents to this servant on the promise that he would work to repay the money. I don't know if you know a lot of 10,000-year-old people, I do not. If this guy were 20 years old and was gonna live to be 100, he could work for 80 years straight and never put a dent in this thing. I don't know if Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates were his uncles who wanted to bequeath him all kinds of money, but I'm telling you right now that when the day came to pay it, he didn't have it. And the king having him brought in front of him sees that he's gonna lose the money. There's no way to get that back. So he's going to cut his losses. He's going to take the man and his family and his possessions, and he's going to sell them and transfer the loan to someone else who will give him some money for it. He's going to get some money back. He's going to do what he can to get something. It's a bad, bad debt, bad loan. And this is actually an act of mercy because he has some other options. So taking and transferring the loan to somebody else and saying, look, what will you give me for this thing? I've got this guy, and basically you you can work him and his family forever because they're never going to pay it off. What's that worth to you? Obviously, you're not going to give me 10,000 talents. What will you give me? He's got 80 years. 80 talents? Is that what? Where are we on this? That's an act of mercy because what he could do is throw him into prison. The debt's due. It's payday. This is time. He could do that. I don't know if you're aware much about prison. You don't earn a lot. Once you're in prison for the debt, it's kind of difficult to pay it off. You're not going to be earning money. And so the only chance you've got is if someone on the outside has enough to pay the essential ransom to get you out of that debtor's prison. Again, 10,000 years of earnings. 
It's not looking great. So the king doesn't take that route. He says, I'm just going to sell this slave and take his possessions and sell it and get what I can, and he'll still have his family with him. They'll just work for somebody else. I'll get something out of the deal. They'll work for somebody else, and everything will be fine. And the slaves had rights. They had things they could do. They were servants. You couldn't treat them as if you actually really owned them. It was a different thing. They were just servants. So this guy has still hope even though he's going to have to be somewhere else. But there is this devastating reality that he's never going to be able to get out of it, and now he's put his family into it as well. And so he gets on his knees, and he says, please have mercy on me. I will repay you. I don't know if you've spent a lot of time on your knees. I don't know if you've ever felt like you've done something so wrong that you end up there. It's not a comfortable place, and this guy is begging for him and for his family, please have mercy on me, and I will repay you. Did you catch that? I will repay you a debt that can never be paid. I'll repay you the 10,000 years worth of earnings I owe you. I will repay you. It is a ridiculous response made in desperation for a man who is going to lose everything and has sold his family into it as well. And the king knows this. The king can do math And the king has pity on him and says, I'll forgive the debt. Grace and mercy are often used interchangeably. They don't mean the same thing. Grace is God's unmerited favor toward us. It is when God gives us the thing we don't deserve. It is the free gift of salvation. It is that, and that is true. Mercy is related, but a little different. Mercy is about not getting what you do deserve. The king here has rights. The slave, the servant, can be foreclosed upon can have everything he has taken away, can have his family sold off. The king has many rights, and instead, he shows mercy. That same servant goes out, and on his way out, as if in the line he sees him there walking out, he finds another servant who owes him money. A hundred denarii. A hundred denarii. A denarii was basically one day's earnings. This guy owes the first servant a hundred days' earnings. And he starts choking this man, this guy who owes him a hundred days earnings, a little more than a quarter, a little over three months earnings. He starts choking him and he says, give me what you owe me. Pay the debt. And the debtor says, I can't do that. I don't have it. Pay me what you own me. And the debtor falls on his knees and says, please, have mercy on me. I will repay you. Did you catch that? He can repay him. He just can't do it today. He can't satisfy it today. He can't bring about and make it right today. In the moment where they are, he can't fix it. But he can over time. He can eventually. And the first servant says, no and has him thrown 
into prison. Not traded off to another family, not changing out the debt. No, has him thrown into prison where he will not be able to earn a dime. Now on complete dependence that someone out there will see his plight, his debt where he's stuck and pay off the 100 days wage so he can get out. And until he does, he will wither in that prison until someone comes to save him. The other slaves, the other servants, they see what's going on. They saw what happened in line just out of eye shot and ear shot of the king. They notice what's happening and the Greek is pretty specific that they go in and they give a detailed explanation because they are offended at how ridiculous this situation is. And they go to the king and the king hears about it. Have you ever thought much about the first servant? I found myself thinking about him while writing this sermon. Have you thought about the fact that the first servant is 100% legally within his rights? Have you ever thought about the fact that he's technically right? Technically right is a wonderful place for people to live, isn't it? I have been trained in the law. People love to be technically right. This guy's technically right when he throws him into prison. He is within his legal rights. No one is saying he doesn't have the right to do it under the law. And that's what he does. Have you ever considered about the fact that being technically right costs him everything? The king hears about what this man did with his being right, with having the high ground, with having the moral superiority. The king hears about how he treated his fellow servant, and the king drags him in and says, you wicked servant. How dare you? I forgave you more than you could ever repay. Your whole life lost in debt. And you couldn't find mercy for your fellow servant. Could you not have had mercy as I had mercy? The king doesn't take and put him into a new master and just trade off the debt, doesn't sell him, doesn't do those things. No, the king has him put in debtor's prison to be tortured until he can repay the debt that could never be repaid. He won't see his family anymore. He will never be out, and unless somebody else pays the debt, this man will rot in prison, suffering the rest of his existence. And Jesus ends by looking at Peter and says, this is how the Father will treat those who do not forgive from their heart. This parable isn't about giving people what they don't deserve. It's about not giving them what they do. The forgiveness of God here isn't treated like a blank check with which we can go and live in any way we want to. I understand, I'm a Baptist, I have heard people say that that is the case. I'm simply telling you this passage is frightening if that is your belief. Because what it says is that the freedom that was bought with a price for you actually conditions you to be a different way. This isn't a blank check. It's a forbearance agreement. Happens all the time in our society. Somebody can't pay the debt. And so instead of taking the house, the bank says, we're going to sign a piece of paper that we both acknowledge that you have defaulted on your loan and we could take it and that we're not going to anyway. Instead, you keep paying, and at some point down the line, we'll refinance, we'll fix, we'll do something. You do the best. You can do $800 a month. We'll take that. We'll do it. We won't take your house. It's a forbearance agreement, and it is conditioned on the thing that you keep doing your part. 
Not that you can just go do whatever you want from now on. And in this particular case, it seems like what Jesus is saying is that when the Father shows us such lavish and great mercy, he doesn't ask us, but he tells us, and you will do the same. It's risky, apparently, to refuse to forgive. Not those who don't ask, not those who don't want it, but the one who comes and asks. Remember, that's what the whole story was about. What happens if the person that I go to and I say I've got a problem with comes and they say, I recognize I did something wrong and I'm sorry. Jesus says, for that one, you shall forgive. Who's wronged you? Not the question I bet we all want right now. Who hurt us? Who stepped on your faith? Who are the people in your church or in your lives who, you're not so mad because they hurt you, it's that they weren't respecting God, they hurt your kids, they hurt a friend, they did something else and you are right and you know it. Let's assume that you're right and they're wrong. Are you going to give them what they deserve? You have the authority and the right, don't you? Jesus before this says, who you bind will be bound. I concern myself with that verse. You can create problems for people. The guy at the end of the story who is only owing 100 denarii doesn't get out of prison here. I'd like to believe the king goes out and gets him later on. I don't know how that part ends. What I know is he was stuck for a while in there because somebody didn't show mercy. And I guess my question for you is, who hurt you? Who needs forgiveness? Who's willing to accept it if you give it? That maybe we don't want to have the conversation because we're afraid they'll ask for it. Maybe you've never had that feeling. I sure have. I believe that we really want people to experience the life-changing mercy of Jesus Christ. We just aren't sure we want it to come directly from us. Forgiving them when they ask so they can see mercy firsthand. I know the arguments and I hear them in my head each and every time. They'll just do it again if there are no consequences. They need to learn. It's not that they're offending me, it's they're disrespecting God. It's they're going to do something awful to his house, his name, his people. It's not that they're destroying their own lives, they're, they're tearing up the church, the country, the health of their kids. While we are in sin, destroying our lives, hypocritical in and outside the church, tearing up our world, sinning against others, not being who we needed to be to our friends, our family, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our husbands, our wives, while we are broken and mired in debt, Christ died for us. He came into the world to save it, not to condemn it. We are given mercy and told, not asked, to show the same because we're gonna keep running into people who need it. And it might just be that they find mercy from the king because they first hear about it and see it from you. One day, standing in a light of debtors, lined up all with us, we might just hear in the distance, blessed, are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Let's pray. Great God, we thank you very much for the debt that you paid for us. A lot of us may feel like the thing that we had in our lives wasn't all that bad. Maybe, maybe we don't see the entire magnitude of our sin and our brokenness. Maybe we don't get that, God, but the truth is you do. Hanging on that cross, you were very aware of exactly what it cost to redeem everything we are, to redeem all of us all at once together. You saw me and paid the price anyway, and we recognize it's not one that we could ever repay. There are people that hurt us, And sometimes we're afraid to even offer forgiveness because what if they ask? What if they want it? How could we possibly forgive? 
We ask that today in this place, those of us who struggle with that, maybe we come and pray. Maybe we pray in our seats. Maybe we come to the altar and pray. And we just ask you, God, to give us your kind of forgiveness, the same forgiveness that was so merciful and gracious to all of us. We ask that that kind of mercy would be in us and we would give it to them. And that in this place, there would be a lot of forgiveness offered out there in Richardson and Dallas across the Metroplex, Texas, and the world this week. I pray all this in your name, Christ Jesus. Amen. If you are somebody who could just use some mercy in your life, you don't have anyone who's ever told you you're forgiven. Come find out how great that feels. I don't know your story after last week. Some of you know mine. And the truth is, I have often felt like I needed some mercy. Today in this place, it is available for you. Nobody will withhold it. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are. You were offered grace and mercy both today here. And we pray that you would come find it. We're going to sing together. And as you come, I'll be here waiting for you. somebody who still wants to talk about the need for mercy and grace, and please understand something. Forgiving someone doesn't mean staying in an awful situation for yourself. That wasn't a part of the sermon today. But if you're somebody who in this place today finds that you need that, you can come talk to me. I'll be at the next steps room. It's to my left and your right. And right out there, we'll be there. If you're somebody who you're looking for a place to serve in our church, you heard about those testimonies today. Today is a great time to get involved and serve. I find that before the pastor get here is a great time to start getting every bit of the muscles of this body stretched out, and maybe it's a really good time to get yours involved as well. We hope you will come and get to see and learn about you a little bit better. Andy, I believe you have it.